All right. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thanks for taking time to uh, join us. And um, my name is Carl Kelpfleisch, um, based here in uh, Denison, Texas. Uh, my wife, uh, Mandy, is also on the phone. As I mentioned, she'll be fielding the chat. And Craig Boswell, our uh, co-founder, um, he and I have presented this material about 150 times uh, throughout the state of Texas and online and um, other locations. I've done seminars in Virginia and various places as, as my wife and I have had the opportunity to travel. So um, when Craig and I started out, you know, we, we, learned some, we learned some things and we found a, a training material that was about an eight-week class. And, you know, we went to various churches and asked them if we could host this eight-week class. And we got, you know, fairly, um, you know, negative um, you know, res responses of, of wanting to host such a class. So we thought that um, boiling what we'd know down into a couple hours and presenting that pictures. material oh. and, then, Go to the cool. and then basically presenting that. Sorry, let me, there's a little bit of background noise. And then presenting that material in such a way that you have the information and then you can then go out, um, share the gospel, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one with people. And then Craig and I make ourselves available. So if you happen to be, you know, around the Dallas Metro or North, North Texas, you know, we can meet with you uh, personally. Otherwise, you know, we, can, we can schedule other, you know, video uh, follow-ups, other Zoom, Zooms later on to, um, to talk you through some of the specifics. So... This is our agenda for tonight. We're going to have a little bit of an introduction just to kind of, um, you know, talk about the ministry, what we do. We're going to present the uh, biblical basis uh, for evangelism and, you know, look at a number of Bible verses. And then we're going to look at some famous quotes from various preachers uh, throughout um, history and what they say about uh, sharing the gospel. That portion of the material takes, you know, the first 45 uh, minutes or so. And then the, the last, you know, a little more than half, we talk about using gospel tracks, how to engage someone in a conversation. And then we'll wrap up. We do have some slides that discuss uh, various types of outreaches, door-to-door -door evangelism, you know, things like that, that we, you know, can get into if there's interest or you know, uh, save those for another, uh, another day. We want to start out with a quick video. This is about five minutes, but uh, this really kind of sets the stage uh, for what we're going to talk about. So if you just listen in and then we'll, uh, we'll have a short discussion about this. I think that if you're a true Christian, you don't consider Christianity just a part of your life. It is your life. And if you follow the teachings of the Bible, specifically uh, Mark 16, 15, which says, go out into the world and preach the good news to all creation, then uh, you have an obligation to share that faith with others. If you saw a building on fire and you knew there were people in it, and you knew that you were capable of running in there and saving someone who wouldn't be able to help themselves, if you knew that you could help them, would you just stand there and do nothing? And unfortunately, by not clearly seeing the issue, I think that's what a lot of Christians do, is they just stand there. I think, by and large, most of it is that most Christians are not really well-educated as to their own religion's position on various issues. They consider worshiping Jesus to be part of their lives, but not their primary purpose. And I believe that true Christianity considers it to be the primary purpose. And if you're a true Christian, you believe that those who are not Christians, those who have not followed the truth of the Bible, uh, that have not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior, those people aren't going to heaven. They're going to hell. Hell's not a fun place. Christians, definitely, uh, that have the view that everyone is entitled to their own belief. And that's not necessarily a bad position to have. But if you believe that what they believe is going to earn them a place in eternal suffering, then there's a problem with that. 
in that you're allowing them to be tortured for eternity while at the same time believing that you shouldn't save them from that. It's, it's very awkward. If you really believe that uh, people who are not Christians are going to hell, then that is a, a very serious consequence. And if you don't take that seriously, I think that you might be compromising your own belief system. Those who do take their faith seriously, they need to encourage or teach those who might not how important that is. Sometimes I think Christians are afraid of being labeled as a Bible thumper or uh, to have uh, negative connotations associated with them. But that's not necessarily negative if you're a Christian. I think it's something to be proud of. There's nothing to be ashamed of if you're a Christian about the Bible or being a Bible thumper. It's something to be proud of. It's something that you take seriously. And it's something that you should encourage others to take seriously as well. And it might require you to challenge yourself to, you know, stand up in front of crowds, to talk to people that you don't know. Missionaries work in places uh, where the predominant religion is not Christianity. And that's a completely different scenario uh, than, you know, in most parts of the United States. But they, they take it in stride, they accept it, and they move on. You shouldn't take rejection personally, but consider it uh, that you gave them a fighting chance. You give them a fighting chance at heaven. Uh, even, if, even if you do have to... Uh, risk offending someone or risk a friendship uh, it's a simple matter of weighing priorities if I were a Christian of course I would take the Bible seriously I respect people who take their beliefs seriously and I would take the Bible's teachings seriously among those teachings is the idea that there is a heaven and there is a hell and those that accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior go to heaven those that don't go to hell and the implications of that are very far reaching and you're an atheist? Yes, I sure am. So I don't know how many times I've seen this video now. And I'm still, you yeah. know, kind of blown away, you know, by the end of, you know, so you're an atheist, right? And so, you know, what we really see here is the world knows what we as the church, you know, we as Christians, they know that we should be uh, sharing the gospel. They know that we should be obeying God's word, um, you know, reading the Bible and all of these things. And so, you know, if the world knows that and then they see us not doing that, you know, then they then they begin to wonder, like, you know, why, why aren't people um, taking these things seriously? So um, we just, we found that video, find it to be very um, compelling um, starting point. So I'd like to start with an introduction to our ministry. So Bazugan Ministries, we exist to equip and encourage believers in Jesus to share the gospel. Um, we founded our ministry in 2007 officially. Um, the ministry was, was really kind of uh, born out of Craig and I doing uh, a number of years, probably eight to 10 years of uh, weekly Bible study, book Pepper's study. What's that? Oh, sorry, I didn't know my thing. So we we were doing weekly Bible study and and um, book studies together, and eventually, you know, we both had a, a heart for evangelism, a heart for the lost, and that led us into studying a book by um, Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron called "The School of Biblical Evangelism." We got part way into that, and we decided, you know, hey, we should go do this someday. And so we started going to a to a mall in North Dallas at lunchtime, sharing the gospel. And you know, before long, um, we thought you know people might want to contact us, you know, from a from a witnessing conversation. And so we came up with the name Bazugan. It's a German word that means testify. Um, the ministry is registered as a nonprofit with the IRS and and is funded by uh, tax deductible uh, donations. Uh, this slide actually a little bit out of date. We uh, just shipped our seven millionth gospel track in the most recent uh, track club. And, you know, we put together this seminar as a way to sort of jumpstart people. You know, we recognize through our track club, we connect with a lot of people, you know, and maybe you just like thought, you know, it'd be interesting to get a gospel track. You know, I've 
I've got a whole bunch of gospel tracks in my hand here, but what do I do with them? You know, because I can remember before we did this, buying tracks at the Christian bookstore, but they just sat around collecting dust because I didn't really know what to do. Um, so what we found uh, over the years of our ministry is that everything we did kind of fit under this umbrella called Pray, Learn, Go. And so we, we take prayer very seriously. We recognize that, um, you know, Satan doesn't want us to do what we're doing. Um, you know, no matter what's going on, you know, in the world, you know, politically, um, you know, whatever Hollywood is doing, you know, the answer to all of these things is the gospel. And so we we focused on two types of, of prayer. The first was an extension of the National Day of Prayer, where we we were we were out praying at City Hall one one year in 2010, and one of my friends looked at me and said, "Why do we do this once a year?" And we we're all kind of uh, you know uh, beyond ourselves. We didn't really know the answer to that, and so we just decided we'd come back the next month. And so since since May of 2010, Craig, myself, and um, a number of others have been uh, having monthly prayer meetings there and at our city hall in Carrollton, at Craig's office in Dallas, at the you know location in in Rockwall, Texas, and we put together material and send it out. And anyone that would be interested in that, there's information in the in the latest uh, Bazugan blast that went out um, over the last couple of days that really we're just looking for people that will pray for the nation leaders and, you know, especially revival, because this is really, you know, what's tilling up the soil so that when a track comes along, you know, maybe the ground is a little bit more uh, fertile for someone to receive it. Um, we also have a third Monday uh, conference call. Um, we've kind of put this on hold for probably the first quarter, maybe the next, you know, one or two more months, but we plan to pick this back up um, now that we've got our zoom um, set up we'll probably restart this here um, so look for a you know an email announcement an announcement in the track club letter but this is really an opportunity for anybody involved in the track club and the ministry in any way whether you're you know a track club member and you got your first envelope and you want prayer to hand out the tracks or if you've got a you know sick loved one or something you know we just we get on the phone for a half hour, share, you know, kind of what's going on locally, and then, um, you know, pray for one another. And then we, and then under the learn is things like the seminar, the blog, uh, we have, you know, our YouTube channel, all our social media. So all of these things is really can, in, can considered to be an ongoing uh, learning process. And then there's the go. So go can be, you know, share the gospel as you go. That's a really big thing that we'll get into here in the next couple of slides, um, but it also could just it could be a you know an organized outreach and a parade or a football game or or all kinds of things that we'll that we'll talk about. So before we really get into you know the the how to do it, we we like to start with you know what is the gospel, you know because in the over the years of teaching this seminar, one time we got to the end of the material and realize that there was a person in our in our audience who wasn't saved and so you know we like to start out and to say like here's the gospel message and then we'll show you how to to uh, present that so we start here with john uh, chapter 3 verse 19 and this is the judgment the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil so you know right away what we see is that there's a sin problem and you know I'll just take a quick poll in the chat, or if you want to unmute yourself, does anyone have an idea um, how many religions there are in the world? And, and I know that um, from a from a purist perspective, you know, really the answer is like, you know, zero or one, you know, or, you know, one being, you know, not non-Christian Christian. Christian. Um, but as far as like, if you were actually to name out all of the different groupings, you know, so if anyone has any ideas, you can post it in the chat, but, you know, um, you know, probably everybody has at least one of these, you know, uh, smartphones. So, you know, one, one day while I was driving to meet a friend for lunch, I kind of had this question in my mind, like, how many religions are there in the world? And fortunately, you can type that into any search engine 
and you'll find you know lots of answers and came to a to a website that it actually categorized 4200 different religions that were you know their by their definition you know had like an organized you know leadership with some you know definition of what the religion meant and what it meant to be a part of it how to join all kinds of stuff like that and um you know and so so on the one hand you can then look at this verse here where jesus says i'm the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me so you can either look at that as very exclusive as there's one way or very inclusive because the invitation is there for everybody right but so when we start talking about you know what is the gospel really we're looking for an answer that's you know, grounded solely in Jesus, not Jesus plus works, not, you know, Jesus plus being a member of some church or Jesus plus anything or anything other than Jesus. You know, we've heard of a, of a, you know, a mainstream denomination recently saying that there's other ways to salvation besides Jesus. And I'm like, well, don't think that's the case. So, um, you know, that, that excludes them, you know, from, from that, um, from that one way. And so really the message is we've all sinned, we fall short of God's glory. And what Jesus says are really the first words that, he, that we see in the scripture in Mark 1.15, Jesus comes on the scene, he says, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent of your sin, turn away, turn towards God and believe in the gospel, the good news that Jesus lived a perfect life died on the cross, paid the, you know, paid the penalty of the sin of the world. So this is the message that we want to then talk about. Um, how do we share that with people? Right? Because it sounds easy enough, but like, you know, probably not just going to walk up to someone and just, you know, you know, lead with John 319, <laughs> you know, I mean, we have a track that has that on the front, basically, but, you know, you can, you can, you know, kind of work into it. So the biblical basis for evangelism, you know, what we think of is we start in Matthew 28, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So literally what he is saying is as you go or as you are going, and that's why, you know, a number of years ago, we made, um, you know, wristbands. It says, as you go on it, you know, because you could look at this to say, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the command is not um, uh, to go, but to make. So you don't have to go to. Uh, you might have to go back into the messenger app. So you don't, you don't have to go to um, Africa or India, you know, because what he's saying is as you go, you the, the fact that we're going is already implicit, right? I mean, after work, I went to the gas station. Now I could look at that as to say, I went there to get gas, but I also, I left a, a track in the gas, in the gas pump uh, credit card slot. <clears throat> so what we did then is to really boil it down and make it very simple. We put a lot of these ideas of ways that you can share the gospel as you go on this blog. So if you go to bazugan.org slash as you go, you know, there's probably hundreds of examples of, um, you know, how to share the gospel, um, you know, just sort of in simple, uh, you know, ways like that. Um, did someone have a question? I, I think someone was off mute, but I and I muted him again. But does does anybody have a question? I see Matthew said, "Do you print the track?" So I mean, we we use uh, one million tracks out of uh, Michigan. Uh, we have very good uh, partnership with Mark Clementosh that runs that uh, that business. So all of our uh, Bazugan tracks are printed by him, and. Um, you know, we, we make all of our tracks available um, by donation, whatever we have on hand. But also, if you go to his website, onemilliontracks.com, then you can actually purchase any of our tracks. And the probably the, the advantage of purchasing uh, from Marv is if you wanted to customize the track and, you know, put your own, you know, email address or your own phone number, you know, because all of our tracks, you know, if you look on the 
on the back. And I think everybody's a track club member, but you'll notice, you know, it has our phone number and our website, you know, but if, if you had, you know, your local church was, was handing these out and you wanted to put, you know, um, you know, Calvary chapel, whatever city, whatever you could, you could put that and uh, he could print it on there. So as far as it, um, abortion tracks, I mean, we do, we do have one that we made um, that has a Ronald Reagan quote um, on the front. Um, you know, with it, Reagan had a, had a famous uh, quote of, um, I've noticed that everyone that, that is for abortion has already been born. Um, so we do have that. I, I, I don't know that I have any on hand. And then we also made a, a postcard that's, um, you know, we mailed, we had a mailing list of all the abortion clinics in the state of Texas, and we mailed a copy of the postcard there, and we handed them out at other um, abortion clinics. Um, we don't have anything specific for LGBT. I think a lot of the other um, track uh, printers have probably covered that um, pretty well. I think One Million Tracks has one. I think Living Waters might have one of those. So, so we go on to um, 1 Peter 3.15. It says that we should always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for the reason that there's hope within you. So, you know, I don't know about you guys by a show of hands, you know, or or anything like that. But, you know, if anybody's ever asked me about the hope that's in me, you know, maybe was once or twice in my whole life. But one of the things, you know, one one time that I do remember um, is a, is a time when I was leaving for church on a Sunday morning and my next door neighbor like asked me like, hey, where do you go every Sunday? And, you know, I was able to tell him about that. But the thing that I found in the, and by using gospel tracks is it presents the opportunity, you know, to talk to people, you know, you, we can look at the track as a, as a hit and run and you hand it to them and run away. Or you can look at it as, you know, here, check this out. And then, you know, wait a minute, and uh, and see what their response is. Um, as far as Fellowship Track League, we do refer a lot of people there. I don't personally use their tracks because I have, you know, 10,000 gospel tracks in my closet, um, but we do refer a lot of people there. Um, you know, I don't have any problem with them, and, and especially with um, a lot of international people contact us, and I know Fellowship will, will ship internationally. Um, so we've looked at kind of five approaches. What I would say is um, um, the website, I think the website that we mentioned so far is this uh, zugan.org slash as you go. Oops, it's sent to the wrong, everyone. And then the 1 million tracks. I think it's .com. Okay. Um, so the five approaches that we listed here, this is kind of the, con the concept of five, five approaches to church growth, right? So there's biological growth, meaning, you know, a couple, a Christian couple gets married in the church and they, um, you know, have kids, raise them in the church. Um, there's invitation to church where um, you know, you're going to church, you invite your friends to come and they hear the gospel when they get there. You know, we could send missionaries. So, you know, nothing wrong with missionaries. Our local church supports uh, missionaries. I think on uh, Sunday's uh, service, I think they were talking about some missionaries we have currently serving in France. So not to say there's anything wrong with any of those things. What it is, what this slide is about is where where Bazugan really fits in is the last two bullets. So there's sort of this kind of concept of friendship evangelism where, you know, the idea is, you know, if you're friends with your friend long enough, you can then introduce them to Christ. Um, it, it actually turns out the longer you know somebody, the better you know somebody, the harder it is to share the gospel with them. And, you know, I'll give you an example. So the first time Craig and I um, ever did, you know, kind of went to the mall to share the gospel. We had a friend who was also teaching people to share the gospel. He had a group of, I think, about 20 um, students from the University of Nebraska, and he had them all come down to Dallas. Um, there's a mall in the north side of Dallas called the Galleria Mall, 
And my friend had asked me, you know, do you know anybody that knows this way of the master method of evangelism? And I said, well, you know, Craig and I have been studying it. We've never actually been out to do it. And it turned out that was the best he could come up with. So uh, we were the trainers. I mean, us along with him and one other guy and um, these 20 college students show up and we train them in sharing the gospel using the way of the master method from living waters in the parking lot of this shopping mall. Um, the Galleria mall is a pretty high end, you know, mall with all the Nordstrom's and, and stuff like that. And after we were done with training, we decided, you know, we should, um, we'll go inside, we'll eat dinner in the food court, and then we'll walk around the mall and we'll, we'll share the gospel with people. So as we're walking in, I had a group of, I think three or four, you know, college students with me. And one of them, as we're walking, she goes, so have, have you ever done, how many times have you done this? And I said, well, counting today, that would be one, right? <laughs> and she goes, well, I have a question. She goes, wouldn't it be better to share the gospel with people that we, that we know? And, you know, of course, with me also being very new, I called Brad over and I said, hey, she has a question and was suggesting maybe this would be better suited for people that we know real well. So he looks at her and says, is your grandmother saved? And she goes, no. And he goes, well, let's call her on the phone and share the gospel with her. And she looks back at him. He says, you know, I think talking to strangers would be okay. So, <laughs> you know, it, I mean, just the point being that the more, the, the closer we know somebody, the harder, actually the harder it is. So with all of that to say, what we really focus on is what we call contact evangelism. So someone that we come in contact with these are the people that we're primarily sharing the gospel with. And like I said, not to exclude friendship evangelism. I mean, um, members of my family aren't saved. I've given them, you know, probably half the tracks that we, that we print. I mean, we wrote a booklet a few years ago and uh, had a family gathering. I brought a copy of the booklet to everybody in the family said, hey, I wrote this booklet, thought you might be interested in having a copy, you know, gave it all to them, you know, and so we do, we do do that also. Um, but just, um, you know, to point that our, our main focus is this, is this what we call contact. So Acts chapter 1, 8, it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to, on, on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So this really gives us kind of two things. One is we're getting power from the Holy Spirit, right? It's kind of like I take my I take my cell phone and, you know, by the time I go to bed at night, the little battery indicator will be down to, to zero, right? And so I have, a, I have a plug that I plug in here and it recharges during the night. The neat thing about the Holy Spirit is I don't have to plug in, you know, once I've been born again, God is giving me the power, you know, and if you knew me from, you know, growing up, I was very introverted, very shy you know, really wasn't interested in talking to people. Um, but that power coming from the Holy Spirit, you know, enables me, gives me words to say. I mean, there's so many times when Craig and I have gone out to a mall, had conversation with somebody. And afterwards, I'm like, Craig, what did we say to this guy? He's like, no, neither one of us can remember, you know, because God just gives us the words, you know, at just the right time. He, he really is equipping and working through us. The second thing that this verse is telling us is, where we are supposed to be doing this, right? So Jerusalem, if you, you know, read this verse in the context, Jerusalem is where they were, right? So for me, Jerusalem is Denison, Texas, you know, for, for you, your Jerusalem might be Indianapolis, or, you know, Daytona Beach, or, you know, um, you know, wherever you live, what, look at your address, what's the, what's the city that's there, it's a city state zip, Whatever that city is, that's your Jerusalem, okay? Now it says in Judea. So Judea is like the surrounding area, right? So when I go out from, from, from here, you know, the area where we live, you know, is called Texoma. It's like an area of southern Oklahoma, northern Texas, where it can go down to the Dallas Metroplex and DFW can be, you know, my Judea. So Judea is really kind of like a larger area. Um, you know, in their, in their, in their way, but it can be in our way too. So, you know, you might live in, you know, um, 
a suburb of a city, well, the whole city or the whole county or whatever might be your Judea. You know, Samaria was really where the enemy lived, right? I mean, you know, when you read the story of, uh, of Jesus going to the, to the woman of the well, he says, I must go this way, right? He didn't have to go that way. I mean, it was out of his way to go that way. He went that way because he knew he was going to share the, the gospel, you know, with somebody, he had to go. And then to the ends of the earth, that's everywhere, right? I mean, and unfortunately, you know, we're, we're a small, you know, we're a small ministry. We can't supply every track to every person, um, you know, and, and we do, as I mentioned, you know, especially when we get requests from overseas, which happens a lot when people like to look at our YouTube channel and, and uh, you know, want resources and, you know, in, in some cases not cost effective. And in a lot of cases, you know, our tracks are not, they're not geared to be, um, culturally relevant to to every country in the world or in the right language and so in a lot of those cases we do refer people to fellowship track league who can can help with that romans 1 6 i am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of god for the salvation of everyone who believes first for the jew then to the gentile so you go back you know to the beginning when i asked how many religions there were and they said you know there's 4200 now if you just pick some of the top ones like you know islam and mormonism you know jehovah's witnesses now imagine if you had to answer every person's objection to you know their religion or every point of their religion or you needed to know everything about their religion in order to share the gospel with them you know that would be very difficult um you know first of all it would probably be impossible you know it's like we don't even know what all these 4200 religions are and so this actually gives great you know comfort is that the gospel itself is the power for salvation right so if i'm talking to a to a muslim the gospel is the power of salvation if i'm talking to a mormon the gospel is the power of salvation if i'm talking to a catholic gospel is the power of salvation if i'm talking to an atheist gospel is the power of salvation so this actually greatly simplifies you know what we need to know and you know if we know jesus we know what we need to know and you know a lot of this a lot of this training is really just kind of the encouragement to take that next step there's so many more verses that we can go into um these two uh links here on our website um you know list a lot more of them um i can um I can send. I'll. I, I can send an email at the end. I know. Um, I can see Jamie's taking a lot of notes. I apologize. I, I can send a, a link or um, or something at the end. I'll. I'll send an email out uh, to everybody that had uh, registered. Um, you know, with all these links and everything, they're all on our blog. So you can see is bazooka.org/blog. So my guess is, if you just went there and searched for you know biblical bases or something, it'd probably come right up. So. You know, don't worry about, you know, copying down every question mark P equals 112 and stuff like that. Um, I can I can get that out to you afterwards. So what I'm going to do now is hand over to uh, to Craig and Craig's going to walk us through some um, quotes from famous people uh, throughout history. Thanks, Carl. Uh, hello to everybody. Um, coming to you live from Tioga, Texas, actually now south of where Carl is, used to be always north. Uh, there's certainly nothing we can add to the scriptural basis uh, for evangelism. Obviously the word of God is the defining need for why we need to be out there sharing the gospel. But we include these quotes because they take those words and uh, succinctly uh, bring some of those points out and always like to start with Charles Spurgeon, just love everything he has to say. So there's a quote from Charles Spurgeon and we love to share this one when we do this in a big audience because I I'm going to guess most people that would sign up for this uh, seminar either are already out there on the street sharing the gospel or obviously have a strong desire to do it. But when you do this just in a general church and you put this one up there, you can see a lot of squirming in the seats. So Spurgeon <laughs> said, have you no wish for others to be saved? Then you are not saved yourself. Be sure of that. 
And I can tell you that is a convicting uh, sentence right there. Um, you know, the reason to do this is because we have a desire for the lost to be saved because we know what they're facing without the gospel. We, you know, love our, love the Lord and love others. And you can show no greater love for someone else than to be concerned about their eternal salvation, because that's the most important thing in their entire life. And if you're not concerned about their eternal salvation and you really got a question, you know, do I really have the love for others that um, Christ talked about when he boiled down all the commandments into just two. I'm going to leave you with presenter rights, Carl. So I'll ask yep. you to flip. Yep. Thank you. Another Spurgeon. I could do Spurgeon quotes all night, but you probably don't want to be up all night just hearing Spurgeon quotes, but this is another great one. If sinners will be damned, at least them, let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let not one go through unwarned and unprayed for. So the visual Im imagery in this quote is just great. And Carl and I used to do a lot of evangelism in malls. We got thrown out of a few malls, so we don't do it quite as much as we used to. Uh, but whenever I read this quote, I think of him on the escalator with his arms around somebody's knees, bouncing up the escalator saying, here's a track, here's a track. <laughs> but it just, I think the imagery is just, you know, that's the passion that we should have. That's the passion that, you know, uh, the love for the lost gives us. Next. Elton Trueblood, evangelism is not a professional job for a few trained men, but instead the unrelenting responsibility of every person who belongs to the company of Jesus. And this goes to something that, you know, I think you might hear a lot in the church. Uh, we'll do these seminars and someone will come up, well, I just don't have the gift of evangelism mm -hmm. as if you know, there's some magic elixir you drink and suddenly you get the gift of evangelism. Uh, obviously, they're talking about the power of the spirit. But if you look at that, you know, what Paul says about the gift of evangelism, the gift of evangelism is what Carl has. Carl can train and inspire people to go share their faith. He, he is passionate about this and he inspires other people around him. That's the gift is the ability to train and inspire people to go out and share their faith. We all have the call to evangelize. When, it, you know, Christ, when he was about to ascend, didn't say, okay, those of you that have the gift of evangelism, go out and share the gospel with the whole world. The rest of you, you're off the hook. Don't worry about it. Uh, he said for all of them to go share the gospel to all the world. Keith Green, I'd rather have people hate me with the knowledge that I tried to save them. So uh, we've been doing this a long time. I've come in contact with thousands and thousands and thousands of people probably over the years um, sharing the gospel. Some as simply as handing them a track, some having hour or two hour long conversations, some of them with month long relationships. Uh, it, when, when I hand a, somebody a track, you typically get three or four, uh, as you try to engage them, you tr typically get three or four types of reactions. You know, one is somebody's curious and that's great. Uh, you get to, you know, talk to them and learn where they're at and share the gospel. You'll have some people that say, hey, I'm already saved. And we'll talk about this more later. Uh, that is a very general statement. Uh, I think at 1.85% of the people in this country claim to be Christians. Uh, I doubt there's ever been a point in this country where 85% of the people in this country were saved. Maybe only the first three people that set foot in the country, maybe we had an 85% ratio, but once it got beyond about five, wasn't that high. 
And so you definitely want to, and we'll talk about this later, you don't want to take that at face value. That is one of the easiest ways somebody can get out of the conversation. Hey, I'm already saving, you know, mm -hmm. and that to, if you ask the second question, they'll be like, well, I was baptized when I was five, I'm saved, you know, <laughs> right. or my mom was, a, my mom loved the Lord and prayed it for me all the time. I'm saved, you know, so we'll get into that more, but, uh, unfortunately another reaction is indifference get that a lot from young people today mm -hmm. i'm not interested in that i don't care about that that's for old people or the weak-minded it's always funny i'm talking to somebody that's 22 years old they look at me and they go oh christianity is only for the weak-minded and i'm like you know that's kind of insulting <laughs> you're basically saying i just said i'm a christian and you're saying oh that's only for the weak-minded i'm like come on man <laughs> Uh, I would like to but go ahead. Well, I wanted to interject something on this slide, but I, I can wait till you're done. Yeah, but one of the reactions you get and, you know, it doesn't happen often is anger. And, I, and I'll be mm -hmm. honest, I prefer anger to indifference because where anger comes from is the conviction of the spirit. You know, there are people out there that God has been calling them and you know, just like, okay, I probably shouldn't say this, my wife's in the other room, but just like sometimes when your wife is asking you to do something again and again and again, and maybe anger starts to boil up, if God is convicting them and calling them, one of the reactions to that to be anger, I don't want that, I can live my life only way I can, you know, I, I don't need to change, I'm, I'm a man, I can do whatever I want, and the Spirit's calling them, and that can create real anger. And so if you have somebody you know and you uh, witness to them, the anger's not at you. The anger's at the conviction that they're feeling. I, mm -hmm. One of my favorite stories about handing out tracks, I've told this story countless times, is we did a, a couple of times we did evangelism in Vegas. And I was on the strip and I'm handing out traps and, and tracks for the most part, people are just taking them. I'm not really getting to engage many people. A few people we got to engage and not really paying great attention because there's so many people. It's so crowded. You're handing out a bunch. And I handed out one to, okay, she seemed a lot more elderly at the time. I was 10 years younger. She was probably in her 70s, which now is to me as young as I get closer to that. But <laughs> And uh, 70s or 80s and gray hair, little, little, little old lady. And she walked off and like 10 minutes later, here comes that lady coming at me. And she, she would have made a sailor blush. She cussed me out so bad. She's like, what blankety blank right do you have to be out here handing out the, now I'm handing out gospel tracts. There's people right down the road handing out pictures of naked ladies. And yet she's like, what right do you have to hand out this trash material? You blankety blank, get out of here. And I'm like, holy cow. Well, what was that? That was the conviction in the spirit. You know, here she is in Vegas, probably doing something she feels guilty about to begin with. And then I put the word of God right in front of her. Mm -hmm. And it just, she took all the time to walk in a casino, read that all the way back out and find me. I mean, that's what the conviction of the spirit will do. So. Yeah, that's powerful. I mean, the, um, the negative responses, you know, I mean, one day down in the West end in Dallas, I mean, someone just literally, you know, took the card, ripped it to shreds and like threw it at me or threw it in the trash. But the, the one I wanted to really quickly share on is we were out one I used to have this pastor friend and we would go before church on Sunday up to a local park and we would just open air, read the Bible and hand out bottles of water and gospel tracts. And this guy walked by and just started freaking out, cussing at us and went off in a huff saying he was going to call the police. He walked a lap around this place, which is about two miles and came back, you know, it was 45 minutes later. He's like, what the police didn't come i'm like no so he, i guess he then called him again the police come asked me you know what's going on i told him goes and talks to him comes back mr kelb flash would you like to press charges i'm like what are you talking about 
well, you said that he cussed at you and he said he cussed at you and that's verbal assault in the state of Texas. And if you want, I can take him in. And I'm like, nah, you're not, you're not taking him in. So, so he goes, the police officer leaves, the guy leaves, you know, we go home, go ready to go to church. And while I'm driving home, my phone, the text message on my phone goes off and said, from this guy said, you know, thanks for showing Jesus and not having me hauled in the to whatever right so the next the next sunday we were about to go out there again so on saturday i texted him and i said hey my friend and i are going to be out there again tomorrow you know if you want you know he's meeting me at such and such if you want to meet me half hour early we could we could walk together and talk about whatever you want you know whether you want to talk about the bible or god or whatever um you know i'll talk to you about anything so he agrees he meets me and of course first thing he wants to do is talk to me about God and how can you believe in this, you know, crazy serpent and the talking snake and blah, 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 and whatever. We walk a lap around and that then developed into, you know, over a course of five, six, seven years, something like that, just sort of staying in touch with this guy periodically. Um, I mentioned earlier, a little booklet that we wrote, gave him one of the initial copies of it over lunch one day. Um, he called me, eventually called me, we wanted to, you know, get together one day. So we, we um, met up for lunch and I just sort of like, Hey, I'm just going to treat this like meeting up with an old friend. And so I, we meet up and I'm just like telling him about my life. Hey, I'm working at such and such place. I meet up with a friend. We go to the mall, we walk around, share the gospel with people. And, um, and at the time we were really working on this concept of the 21 day challenge where we'd encourage people to read the gospel of John over the course of 21 days. He goes, I'll take that challenge. I'm like, what? This atheist going to take this challenge. So he takes the challenge and I wait the three weeks and no word from him, no word from him, no word from him. Eventually he calls me. I want to get together so we can pray. Right. And I invited him to come to a Bible study with me at a church of like 20,000 people where there's literally 500 guys on a Friday morning and invited him to come to this Bible study. And he showed up and the pastor was preaching on first John. It's like, you couldn't have scripted better for like a new guy show up. And, um, you know, so it was really interesting where we went from, here's this guy, he hates me for preaching the gospel and you know turns into you know a friend who's eventually sitting with me at, at bible study so you never know you, you literally never know how god is going to use those those um, interactions back to you craig all right well we try to get through this part in about 45 minutes skip ahead one more there's one more i want to cover let me see this one Oh, two more I want to cover. <laughs> yes, I want to cover this one. Uh, it is not our business to make the message acceptable, acceptable, but it, to make it available. We are not to see that they like it, but they get it. Uh, this, this speaks to, I, I think we've already had some discussion in the track or in the chat session about this, that, you know, the message of the gospel should be convicting. And it should be challenging to those that are in sin. And, you know, the 85%, when we said 85% of uh, Americans at one point claim to be Christians, um, you know, th there is a lot of preaching out there and we can debate. I don't want to get into debate about this, but you don't need a savior if you don't feel you're a sinner. Mm -hmm. And so... It, it you can't really have somebody that feels they need Christ if they don't feel that they have a need to be saved. And, you know, yeah, you know, talking and, I, you know, the way of the master method, uh, method, you know, very, there's been very, 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 very few people that I've met uh, out uh, witnessing that did not admit at some point that they've told a lie, right? It, it's, it, it, it has happened, but it's very, very rare. So asking, talking to someone about their sin 
it does not mean you, you know, you point a finger in their face and say, man, you are a miserable, wretched, right from the start. That probably might be a little alienating, mm. but you can walk them into it really, really easy. It's one of the things the way the master method does very, very well is walk them into the knowledge of their sin without being completely, you know, confrontational about it. So, all right, one more. Uh, yes. Oh, my friends, we are loaded with countless <laughs> church activities, while the real work of the church, that of evangelizing and winning the lost, is almost entirely neglected. And again, I, I, one of the things that's just been so meaningful about this ministry is, you know, you're on this call, you obviously have a, a desire for the lost, Unfortunately, a lot of us go to church homes, and, and I've been in church homes, where they spent way more time deciding if they should be in a basketball league, and if the church was right, and could we get enough volunteers for a basketball league, or, you know, what, you know, what are we going to do about the hole in the parking lot, and they'll have three-hour meetings on the holes in the parking lot, and then at the end, they'll have five minutes, oh, and you know what, I think we should put up a sign that we're seeker friendly or, you know, and that's the total discussion of evangelism for that week. And it can be frustrating if you're in a church like that, where here you are and, you know, you have this passion for, you know, meeting and reaching the lost. And yet the church seems way more concerned about lots and lots of activities that have nothing to do with reaching the lost. Many of them important. I don't want to blow a tire in the in a pothole in the parking lot, but I really don't want that to be the focus or, you know, how can we, you know, have more softball teams or, you know, all the other things that the door is open. I if they want to come, they'll come on Sunday. <laughs> That's our evangelism yeah. strategy. <laughs> so if you're blessed to be in a church that not that is not like that, and I am right now. Uh, you know, I, praise the Lord that you are in that situation. They're not all like that, but you know, it's uh, it's us. It's up to every individual, you know, to uh, realize that you know when you reach the point in your discipleship walk that you're mature enough to look around and not look inward and see that every single day you come across countless people that don't know the Lord. And if the world ended tomorrow, they would have to face that judgment for all eternity. So, all right, and I let's think really this, I mean, this whole ministry kind of came out of that, right? I mean, I remember sitting mm -hmm. at IHOP and we're on about less than 30 and you looked at me and go, maybe we should go try this. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I think we were both thinking, and I think you said it first, you know, but we could have just sat there and kept studying and not actually done anything. So. Like our other stuff, there's a lot more quotes. I mean, these are not, this is obviously not an exclusive list of quotes to get people motivated um, to share the gospel. But um, we, we can, you know, I think we're doing fine on time. It's five minutes till eight. Um, you know, and I think if, if, um, if people wanted to, if you have any questions, you know, of which quotes stood out to you, um, you know, if you want to post it in the chat or come off a of mute, then, you know, we could have a five minute you know, discussion about that. Um, you know, are there any of these quotes that really, you know, resonate with you guys? Right. Ben, did you have a question, comment? Sure, I'll, I'll put one out there. Um, what is your guys' view on whether a Christian should take the vaccine? Well, I mean, that's probably well beyond the scope of this course. I mean, <laughs> really trying to really trying to focus on, you know, the the discussion questions that we have here. Um, yeah, the only reason is because we get asked that all the time out there on the streets. That is like one of the big topics that always ends up getting, you know, brought up in the gospel conversations and everything. And you know, it gets back and forth about the mask and everything. And it just really had to come back down to it and say, you know, if the mask doesn't save you. The vaccine will not save you. Jesus Christ is the only one that can save you. 
ultimately. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely true. I mean, I'm not, uh, I guess I'm not at a point where I'm going to make fun of somebody for getting a vaccine. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to speak on the behalf of Bazugan Ministries of whether you should get a vaccine or not get a vaccine. Um, you know, having personally had COVID-19 and being sick for a month, um, it's not something that I would want others to have to go through. So, you know, for people who say, you know, it's all a conspiracy theory, this is not true, it's no virus, whatever, you know, my wife, you know, can, uh, can uh, attest that that's definitely not the case because, you know, I don't normally just lay around on the couch for a month and end up in the hospital for a couple of days. So, um, you know, but like I said, I mean, that's, um, that's something that's, that's really um, you know, I think people need to, you know, like you said, I mean, Jesus is the, Jesus is the solution. Um, how people are going to respond to that, you know, is, is, um, you know, up to, up to them and, and, you know, just like, you know, do you get your flu vaccine? Do you get your pneumonia vaccine? You know, things like that. So, you know, I, I don't, from a ministry, take a, take a view on that as, as far as the mask go. Um, having had the, the virus myself, you know, I'm, I'm probably a lot more cautious now, um, with masks. I don't know if they work or not. I don't know if I need one, two or three masks or not. Um, but when I'm around people that I don't know in public, I do wear a mask. Um, that includes when we were going down to the West end, I think Craig goes down to the West end, still have moved away from there. Um, you know, and whether it helps me or whether it helps the person be more comfortable, um, you know, if, if wearing a mask allows me to have a conversation and share the gospel with them, then, um, you know, I would, I would, ra I'd rather wear the mask and have the opportunity than, than not wear the mask and have them be offended by that. But I don't know. Craig, did you have input yeah. on that? Well, I just, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but I always joke that there's a website out there that says 10 rabbit trails to get people to stop sharing the gospel with you. <laughs> Should Trump be our president or whatever? And it is, it, they, should you, why aren't you wearing a mask? Why are you wearing a mask? You know, why is your hair brown? You know, it is a, especially younger people, uh, tend to be great at this. You know, why is there so many versions of the Bible? They can't all be wrong. And, you know, the, the gospel is truly a simple, it's just what you said, the gospel is truly a simple message, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we are, we are sinners and we are separated from God due to our sin. And without Christ, we are going to face the punishment for that. And so, you know, I try to avoid those rabbit trails as much as I can. I, you know, I, I'll say, man, you're entitled to your opinion, or that's something I don't really have a strong opinion on. Or, you know, if you really want to study that, I'd be happy to give you my card. And if you want to study, you know, uh, views on creation versus evolution, that's a, probably an eight to 10 week undertaking for us to do. If you want to engage me on that, that'd be great. But all I know is that if you don't have Jesus, you face the consequences of your sins. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'll leave it at that. I, I don't bicker with people or argue with people. I can't argue them into salvation. Uh, you know, yelling at them won't get them there. Uh, tricking them won't get them there. The Holy Spirit gets them there. You know, right. All I can do is throw seeds out there. And so, and I try not to spend a lot of time on, unless I have time with somebody, you know, I spent weeks on end uh, with a Jehovah Witness where we met on a weekly basis for several weeks. And that was great. And we got into scripture, and, but it wasn't something I was going to convince him in the errors in Jehovah Witness in the seven to 10 minutes I had before he jumped on his plane. So as we go back to here, I mean, it's a great, um, great, great thoughts on, um, you know, the rabbit trails and everything. I think that's, um, that's really good just to be able to draw back. So what really stops us from sharing the gospel? And, you know, as, as we've presented this, you know, many times, talked to lots of people, 
you know, if you took a family feud style answer, you know, number one answer, you know, fear, you know, kind of this idea of we're going to go out and do evangelism or we're going to go out and talk to people about Jesus. That usually just, you know, strikes the, the fear into people. So, you know, one way to look at fear is false expectations appearing real. And there's a comedian, um, Brad Stein, that has a, 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 a skit about a woman in the bathroom. She finds a spider. She has to call her husband. He comes and gets the spider and he, you know, gets it, puts it in toilet paper and sticks it in the commode. And then she comes over and whoosh and flushes it down, right? Like, and his his response is, you know, just once I'd love for that spider to come, blah, you know, and out of the, you know, come back to life and you know, and attack after it's already been, you know, been dead. And that's the kind of thing here is like as as we're talking about, like, like just once when I hand out a track, instead of someone saying no, thank you, you know, they turn into a monster and bite my head off or something like that, you know. But you know, but as Craig has pointed out to one of our seminars, you know, as he's talking, like, well, what do people usually say when you hand them a track? They'll like, oh, thank you very much. You know, so we have this false expectation, this this fear that something really bad is going to happen by approaching a, a person. And so what it leads us to is this concept of the fear of man versus the fear of God, right? And then we go back to the Bible, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell, right? The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me, right? I mean, what's the worst thing that man could do to you is, you know, pull out a gun, blow your head off, and you'd instantly be in the presence of Jesus, right? So, you know, I'm not advocating, you know, to go out, put yourself in in harm's way, you know, but at one at one outreach we were doing, we were at a cotton bowl, and um, I don't know what this guy was doing, but I mean, we were pretty much done. We'd been out there for two hours, handed out thousands of tracks. I'm just standing there minding my business. And the guy comes up, why shouldn't I just take a swipe at you? And I'm like, what? I mean, like I was literally doing nothing at that time, right? So I looked over and I said, you see over there? And he goes, yeah. I said, well, those two of, you know, Arlington Police Department's finest. He goes, okay. I said, you see over there? That group of five guys over there is five of my closest friends. I said, but if you want to take a swipe at me, go ahead. <laughs> and he just walked away, you know, and it's like, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, if you want to hit me, hit me. But um, I don't think you're going to, I don't think you'll get away with it. You know, he wasn't going anywhere, you know, but when we compare that kind of fear and, and we can get into frightening situations, you know, and I'm not advocating to go and put yourself in harm's way and things like that, you know, do, we are firm, you know, believers in, you know, two by two, and, and, you know, we have some women that'll go with us to downtown Dallas, you know, we make sure that a, a man stays with them, or at least the two women are together, things like that, you know, one event, we get done, and this woman's like, well, I'll just walk back to the West End and get on the train over there, and I'm like, not by yourself, you're not, you know, so, so, I mean, we do have to be careful about, you know, things like that, but the real fear is, as it says in Hebrews 10, 31, think about the fear of an unbeliever falling into the hands of God, the fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So when we can, when we can grasp that, like the fear of me opening my mouth and saying, did you get one of these to a complete stranger versus that complete stranger standing before God on judgment day? it just gives a whole new perspective. And so what we found as an effective way to deal with that fear is the use of gospel tracks. So Craig will now, you know, talk us through how we came to, to, you know, to love tracks, make our own tracks and, and um, utilize them. So I get to sign this because to be honest, when we started going through this, I was, some people are anti-maskers. I was an anti-tractor. <laughs> uh, I always thought, well, you know, you hand out tracks and people just throw them away or they throw them on the ground. What good is it? You know, I, I grew up in a, in a 
a denomination that sent tracks to they didn't never handed them out, but they sent them to a lot of people and to send out for other people to send out. <laughs> and uh, it, that was just ignorance. Um, there is no doubt. I mean, the back of all of our tracks contain scripture and, you know, the word of God is living and active, powerful than any two edged sword. It has the power to save. And that's what our tracks have on them, the word of God. And there's, you know, countless stories if you just if i'd have done this before i ever started this it, you know countless stories out there and testimonies of people that a track was instrumental in them coming to salvation um well there you go 50 53 percent come through the written word and yet only two percent actually share their faith Next slide. You want to give a quick intro to the video? Yeah, yeah, absolutely love this video. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory uh, about a uh, gentleman uh, in Australia um, that handed out tracks. And well, let's run the video and then I'll. So the video is about nine minutes. So if you just you know bear with us, but this is this it. is this is really powerful. So hope you hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy it, and I'll. I'll put the I'll put this link in the chat if you want to watch it again later. This message is non-copyright. Duplication is encouraged. A number of years ago, in a Baptist church in Crystal Palace in southern London, the Sunday morning service was closing, and a stranger stood up at the back, raised his hand, he said, Excuse me, Pastor, can I share a little testimony? The pastor looked at his watch, he said, You've got three minutes. And this man proceeded. He said, I just moved into this area. I used to live in another part of London. I came from Sydney in Australia, and just a few months back, I was visiting some relatives, and I was walking down George Street. You know where George Street is in Sydney? It runs from the business hub out to the rocks, the colonial area. And he said, a strange little white-haired man stepped out of a shop doorway, put a pamphlet in my hand, and he said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? He said, I was astounded by those words. Nobody had ever told me that. I thanked him courteously, and all the way on British Airlines, back to Heathrow, it just puzzled me. I called a friend who lived in this new area where I'm living now, and thank God he was a Christian. He led me to Christ, and I'm a Christian, and I want a fellowship here. And Baptists love testimonies like it. Everyone applauded and welcomed him into the fellowship. That Baptist pastor flew to Adelaide in Australia the next week. And 10 days later, in the middle of a three-day series in a Baptist church in Adelaide, a woman came to him for counseling. He wanted to establish where she stood with Christ. And she said, I used to live in Sydney. And just a couple of months back, I was visiting friends in Sydney, doing some last minute shopping down George Street, and a strange little white haired man, elderly man, stepped out of a shop doorway, offered me a pamphlet, and said, excuse me, ma'am, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? She said, I was disturbed by those words. When I got back to Adelaide, I knew this Baptist church was on the next block from me, and I sought out the pastor, and he led me to Christ. So, sir, I'm telling you that I am a Christian. Now, this London pastor was now very puzzled. Twice, within a fortnight, he'd heard the same testimony. He then flew to preach in the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Perth. And when his teaching series was over, the senior elder of that church took him out for a meal. And he said, mate, how'd you get saved? He said, I grew up in this church from the age of 15 through Boys Brigade. Never made a commitment to Jesus, just hopped on the bandwagon like everybody else. And because of my business ability, grew up to a place of influence. I was on a business outing in Sydney just three years ago. And an obnoxious, spiteful little man stepped out of a stop shop doorway, offered me a religious pamphlet, cheap junk, and accosted me with a question. Excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, you're going to heaven. He said, I tried to tell him I was a Baptist elder. He wouldn't listen to me. He said, I was seething with anger all the way home on Qantas to, to Perth. He said, I told my pastor, thinking he would sympathize with me, and my pastor agreed. He had been disturbed for years knowing that I didn't have a relationship with Jesus, and he was right. And my pastor led me to Jesus just three years ago. Now, this London preacher mm. flew back to the UK and was speaking at the Keswick Convention in the Lake District. And he threw in these three testimonies. At the close of his teaching session, four elderly pastors came up and said, we got saved between 25 and 35 years ago, respectively, through that little man on George Street giving us a tract and asking us that question. He then flew the following week to a similar Keswick convention in the Caribbean to missionaries. And he shared the testimonies. At the close of his teaching session, three missionaries came up 
and said, we got saved between 15 and 25 years ago, respectively, through that little man's testimony and asking us that same question on George Street in Sydney. Coming back to London, he stopped outside Atlanta, Georgia, to speak at a naval chaplain's convention. And when his three days of revving these naval chaplains up, over a thousand of them, in soul winning, the chaplain general took him out for a meal. And he said, how do you become a Christian? He said, well, it was miraculous. I was a rating on a United States battleship and I lived a reprobate life. We were doing exercises in the South Pacific and we docked in Sydney Harbour for replenishments. <laughs> we hit King's Cross with a vengeance. I got blind drunk. I got on the wrong bus, got off in George Street. And <laughs> as I got off the bus, I thought it was a ghost. This elderly white-haired man jumped in front of me, pushed a pamphlet in my hand and said, Sailor, are you saved? If you die tonight, you're going to heaven. He said, the fear of God hit me immediately. I was shocked sober and ran back to the battleship, sought out the chaplain. The chaplain led me to Christ. And I soon began to prepare for the ministry under his guidance. And here I am in charge of over a thousand chaplains and we're bent on soul winning today. That London preacher, six months later, flew to do a convention for 5,000 Indian missionaries in a remote corner of northeastern India. And at the end, the Indian missionary in charge, a humble little man, took him home to his humble little home for a simple meal. And he said, how did you, as a Hindu, come to Christ? He said, I was in a very privileged position. I worked for the Indian diplomatic mission. And I traveled the world. And I am so glad for the forgiveness of Christ and his blood covering my sin, because I'd be very embarrassed if people found out what I got into. He said, one bout of diplomatic service took me to Sydney. And I was doing some last minute shopping laden with parcels of toys and clothing for my children, walking down George Street. And this courteous little white haired man stepped out in front of me, offered me a pamphlet and said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, you're going to heaven. He said, I thanked him very much, but this disturbed me. I got back to my town. I sought out the Hindu priest and he couldn't help me, but he gave me some advice. He said, just to satisfy your curious mind, nothing else, go and talk to the missionary in the mission house at the end of the road. And that was fatal advice. <laughs> he said, because that day the missionary led me to Christ. I quit Hinduism immediately and then began to study for the ministry. I left the diplomatic service and here I am by God's grace in charge of all these missionaries and we are winning hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. Well, eight months later, that Crystal Palace Baptist pastor was ministering in Sydney, in Gymea, southern suburb of Sydney. And he said to the Baptist minister, do you know a little man, an elderly little man who witnesses and hands out tracts on George Street? And he said, I do. His name is Mr. Genor, G-E-N-O-R. But I don't think he does it anymore. He's too frail and elderly. The man said, I want to meet him. Two nights later, they went around to this little apartment, knocked on the door, and this tiny, frail little man opened the door. He sat them down, made them some tea, and he was so frail he was slopping tea into the saucer as he shook. And as he sat with them, this London preacher told him all these accounts over the previous three years. This little man sat with tears running down his cheeks. He said, my story goes like this. He said, I was a rating on an Australian warship, and I lived a reprobate life. And in a crisis, I really hit the wall, and one of my colleagues, whom I gave literal hell, was there to help me. He led me to Jesus, and the change in my life was night to day in 24 hours. And I was so grateful to God. I promised God that I would share Jesus in a simple witness with at least 10 people a day. As God gave me strength. Sometimes I was ill, I couldn't do it, but I made up for it for other times. I wasn't paranoid about it, but I have done this for over 40 years. And in my retirement years, the best place was on George Street. There were hundreds of people. I got lots of rejections. But a lot of people courteously took the tracks. And he said, in 40 years of doing this, I've never heard of one single person coming to Jesus until today. Do you know, I would say that has to be commitment. That has to be just sheer gratitude and love for Jesus to do that. Not hearing of any results. Margarita did a little count. That's 146,100 people. That simple little non-charismatic Baptist man influenced somehow to Jesus. And I believe what God was showing that Baptist minister was the tip of the tip of the tip of the tip of this iceberg. Goodness knows how many more had been arrested for Christ and were doing huge jobs out in the mission field. Mr. Genor died two weeks later. And can you imagine the reward he went home to in heaven? I doubt 
if his face would ever have appeared on Charisma magazine. I doubt if there would ever have been a write-up with a photograph in Billy Graham's Decision magazine, as beautiful as those magazines are. Nobody except a little group of Baptists in southern Sydney knew about Mr. Genor. But I'll tell you, his name was famous in heaven. Heaven knew Mr. Genor. And you can imagine the welcome and the red carpet and the fanfare he went home to when he arrived in glory. Well, I've heard that video, I don't know, if we've done this seminar 150 times, about 100 times, and get emotional every time I hear it. Uh, two things that uh, struck me tonight in listening to it again. One is we talked earlier about, you know, the gospel can be an affront to people that don't know Christ. And it's funny, you know, his message was the same. You know, he went up to people, he handed them a track and said, you know, excuse me, do you know Christ? If you died tonight, what would happen? And one person in their testimony said, this obnoxious little man. <laughs> and the other person said, this kindly little man. Now, the message was the same, but it was where their heart was. One was at mm -hmm. the point where he was really needing the message. One thought he was a Christian, was a false convert, and found it very offensive when he was confronted with the true gospel. Message was the same, but the reaction was completely different. Uh, and that's what the gospel does to people. Like I said, when we're in Vegas, you got people handing out pictures of naked ladies, nobody says anything. You hand them a gospel track and they freak out. That's the power of the gospel uh, to change people's lives. And then, you know, the second point, obviously the main point of the video, we don't save people, God saves people. And, you know, I don't know how many tracks I've handed out, thousands and thousands. Carl's handed out thousands and thousands. The ministry's distributed more than 7 million. If you would tell me, and I think Carl would say the same thing, we put out 7 million tracks and only one person was saved because of that. All the rest ended up in a gutter, thrown away, whatever. We would do it all over again. You know, I, it, if, if I hand out 50 tracks a day and 50 get thrown away, 50 tomorrow, 50 get, get thrown away, but I find out on the other side that, you know, on March 2nd, when I stuck a track in a gas station pump, somebody pulled that out and the result of that action was they came to Christ, it was all worth it. And, you know, the tracks are powerful. They do save people, just Google, salvation stories related to tracks and you'll just hear just amazing stories of people carl one of my favorite stories about carl he was out handing out tracks at a football game and uh when we get done so we don't litter we'll go back because a lot of people do throw them on the ground as soon as they see it's a track they throw it on the ground we'll go back and pick them up first you can reuse them save some money uh, second, I'm in the recycling business, so we definitely don't want to contribute to trash. <laughs> and uh, he was in the, you know, going through that. And here's a lady that didn't get handed one, but picked one up off the ground. And she was sitting there reading it. And it turns out she was the girlfriend of one of the scalpers. So that guy was there scalping tickets and she was just there hanging out, not going to the football game. And kind of... Uh, you know, like the Ethiopian, she go, tr Carl talked to her about what she was reading and she says, well, now, you know, I'm not really familiar with this message. And he explained the gospel with, to her right then and there. And her path to salvation was picking up a track off the ground that somebody else threw away, wasn't even handed in. Mm -hmm. So they, they are powerful. So how can we distribute tracks? Well, uh, I doubt anybody on this call probably hasn't done some track distribution, but you know, one of the easiest ways to start sharing the gospel is through tracks. Uh, I always tell people, you know, if you're afraid to have a conversation with somebody, just hand them a track and they say, well, what if they start talking? I say, run, <laughs> don't do that. But one way to share the gospel without actually having a conversation. But, uh, you know, one way you can do it without ever even seeing the human is like I said, sticking in the gas station pump. You never know who's gonna grab it. Uh, one of the neat things that both uh, beer distributors and Coke distributors do is they put a little track slot 
in the top of a 12 pack, just as you're at the grocery store, just drop the tracks right in there and they'll drop right in where the handle is supposed to be. And you just call that the track slot. And somebody's gonna open that up and see that track. Uh, another great one is uh, you mail bills. Well, we don't mail bills like we used to, Carl. When we started this, I still mail bill. Now I pay them all online. But if you do still mail a check at the bill, you can throw that in there with the check. Somebody is gonna open that. Some person somewhere at that company has to pull that check out of the envelope and if that track is in there, they're going to see that track. Leave them in places. Uh, I go to Panera's a lot to pick up food. Panera's actually has a bulletin board that you can stick stuff on. And I'll just stick a track on there. This is a hotel Carl was at. They had a table in the lobby, just threw some tracks on there. When you go to a doctor's office, they always have magazines to read. Open a magazine, stick a track in there. Uh, when I go visit uh, somebody uh, at the hospital, you know, sitting in the waiting room, I'll leave some tracks on the table next to me. Uh, there's just lots and lots of places. And, you know, there's been times where I've left tracks at a place like this, come back later and they're all gone. Now, it could be somebody cleaned them up, but I like to think that people picked them up. Right. Uh, one of the great things about the tracks we use is they're really catchy. Um, and, you know, if people see them, there's the bulletin board. If people see them, they tend to want to look at what they are, uh, you know, what they what they say. And I, when I hand out uh, uh, tracks to people and they'll look at the front and I'll say, hey, You've looked at the front, now flip it over and read the back. You know, uh, we mm -hmm. just try to put something catchy on the front, uh, make you flip it over and read the back. This was a, this is a great one, right? It's got minions on it. Uh, people love these. We go, oh, my kid will love that. And I'm like, well, before you give it to him, make sure you read the back so you know what, what it says, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's the gas station. Do Not I need many to get rid of the payphone too? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're showing some of this material might be a little dated. <laughs> Business reply envelope. There's a little really dated. <laughs> yeah, since the kid on the right's like 21 now. <laughs> in Alaska in the Coast Guard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this is a great one, right? You get all these business reply mails. The postage is already paid. Somebody's going to open that at the end. They're mailing back just with a track in them, and somebody's going to get that track. Door hangers, another great thing. If, if you do door to door, you're gonna hit lots of houses where there's nobody home or they refuse to answer. You can just stick a door hanger on there. Uh, door hangers, uh, same message, uh, uh, really a, a good way to distribute the gospel. Yeah, and a lot of what we're showing here is, you know, if the, if the fear is talking to somebody, you'll notice that we haven't even talked about talking to anybody yet, right? You're going out, you're taking your tracks, you're putting them in gas pumps, leaving them on tables. And even with this, with the door hanger, you can just go to their door, put the door hanger up and leave. And it's not soliciting because you're not trying to sell anything. Um, you know, with that said, if there's a sign that says no soliciting, I usually, well, what we do is we bypass that house, take down their address, and we mail them a postcard instead. Um, although I do remember a place out near Craig's house where it said trespassers will be shot. So I think we skipped that <laughs> house. <laughs> Us country folk, we want to get the message across. <laughs> so then we kind of segue into now you're actually, okay, now I'm comfortable handing tracks. I'm getting, you know, getting up my courage. And now we kind of segue, you know, Craig, you know, you can segue into how do we, you know, actually start engaging people. Yeah, so if you're checking out at the store, these bill tracks are a great thing to hand the cashier uh, after while you're paying. If you're paying with a credit card, hand them one while you're paying. Or the person behind you in line. While you're standing there in line, just turn around and say, hey, did you get one of these? Um, it, a very important thing is, you know, don't say if, you, if you'd like one, just say, hey, did you get one? Because almost everybody will say no, unless they just out and out lie about it because you haven't handed them one yet. And you say, well, here you go. 
uh, with a tip. Um, you can stick, I use the build tracks a lot. Uh, one of the things we talk about here is, I can't remember if it was at a seminar or in a video or what, but uh, we heard somebody say that how much they hated tracks because instead of a tip, people mm -hmm. would leave uh, a uh, gospel track. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't want to do it. You don't want to make the mad person mad right out of the bat. They go in there looking for their tip and all they got was a gospel track. You know, give a, give a generous tip and then leave the gospel track. Uh, don't leave it in lieu of a tip. <laughs> mm -hmm. Go to the next slide here. We've talked about millions already, but... Craig showed the uh, the minion. We also have the Uncle Sam. We have a Jerry Seinfeld track, and then we we have a minion. We have a million pesos too, so not worth near as much. But salvation is still worth the same in Spanish. <laughs> it, one of the things that's neat about these bills tracks is I'll have people. I'll hand them one of these, and they'll come back and ask for more. Mm -hmm. They're so novel. They'll. Uh, I've been out handing out. Uh, had those with me and handing them out downtown Dallas and I'll have somebody come back. Can I have five? I want to give one to all my kids. Kids love them. Mm. Uh, people find them novel. A uh, great place to leave those is at like an ATM machine where the cast comes out. People will see them and they'll stop and go look to see if somebody left cash in there and you've just given them a gospel track. So there's a question in the chat about um, ordering book about ordering door hangers. We do have them. Um, Carl, can you tell them where to go to order them? Yeah, so if you if you go on our uh, webpage, um, donate.bazugan.org, um, that's where you can basically request any resource, and um, you know just just let us know how many you want. You can also um, email me. Uh, um, you can email me at Carl at bazugan.org. Yeah, I spelled it wrong. And I can't remember what we have the suggested donation on there for, but um, we have plenty of bookmarks. And um, for the price of postage, we'd be glad to uh, make them available to you. <laughs> you know, so I think everybody in this in this seminar is in our track club because the you know mostly the invite went out to people in the track club. Um, but if you're not familiar or if you know friends that would be interested, you know, the track club provides 30 tracks per month and, and, um, basically we're just encouraging people to hand out one every day. Um, the, 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 the website is easy to remember. It's enroll.track.club. So if you just go to, go to your web browser, type in enroll.track.club and we'd love you to encourage your friends to join, you know, and just let them know, Hey, I joined this. I joined this track club and I'm handing out a track every day would, you know, would encourage you to, to do the same. And, you know, we're going to make this seminar available on, on YouTube. So if they go, you know, I wouldn't know how to get started, invite them over and show them this seminar, or, you know, we'll, we'll do another one here in a, you know, maybe a month or two. I'll talk to Craig and we'll, we'll figure that out. Um, but yeah, just keep it, encourage you to encourage others to join. Um, we've done 150 mailings. So we, we started this club in 2008. Uh, I think last, last month was our 150th mailing. A uh, little milestone, as Craig mentioned, um, over 7 million tracks. We have members in the United States and Canada. I think almost every state and province is covered, you know, with at least one person. The map is a little out of date, but uh, like several other, like several other slides, but generating the map is not, uh, not that easy. Um, but um, yeah, so I mean, that's a little bit about our track club and, and really oh, what I was going to say is, you know, as Craig mentioned, you know, witnessing to this woman at the, at the football game, I mean, the, the track club actually originated from a football game also. So we owe the Dallas Cowboys a lot, you know, for, uh, for promoting evangelism events, but we, you know, we're, we get to talking to people and you, you ask them, you know, as you're in a conversation, you ask them, you believe there's a God, you believe there's a heaven and a hell. And eventually they identify as a Christian and they're like, yeah, I've, 
been born again. I've repented of my sin, trusted in Christ. And then you're like, um, have you ever shared the gospel with anybody? And these people at this football game, they're like, well, we wouldn't even know where to get tracks like this, blah, blah, blah. And so I, I took down their um, email address and then I emailed them some uh, links and like, you can go buy tracks here, you know, and, and I got to thinking about it. Like if you were going to get started, you'd probably want, you know, several designs. If you go to living waters, you go to different places. Um, then, um, you know, you might end up spending, you know, 30, 40 bucks by the time you have tracks delivered to you. And then it might be a little overwhelming. Now you got 500 tracks show up at your house. And so I got this idea of, um, you know, and I don't, I don't claim I had a, you know, audible from God or anything, but just felt like, why don't we send them the track? So I called Craig and I was like, Hey, I got this idea. Let's send 30 tracks a month. And, um, you know, it was just, we prayed, said, yep, sounds good. And we started sending them out. We had, at that time, we had a list of about a hundred people that were praying for us when we went out to, to witness at the shopping center every Thursday. And so we just did a one-time mailing to those people and told them, you know, if you'd like to get tracks every month, let us know and we'll keep sending them. And I think about three people responded and, you know, months later, someone was like, that was really neat when I got those tracks from you. And I was like, well, you know, as I said, it was a one-time deal. So they signed up and, and it kind of grew from there. Um, I think I see in the chat, someone was asking, I mean, we have about 1200, currently we have about 1200 members. It kind of, it kind of goes up and down. Um, we do send renewals out once a year to ask people to renew their membership. Um, we have like over a hundred inmates in, uh, in different prisons across the U S I mean, it's a whole nother story you can read on our, on our website about, uh, I think the blog article is called, we never meant to start a prison ministry. Um, and we've had, you know, just amazing doors get open, you know, through that. I mean, the Texas prisons decided that you can't mail, um, tracks to the inmates. So we reached out to all the chaplains and the chaplains are like, oh, yeah, this is great. Send the track. So after we reached out to the chaplains, we were sending like 10 times more tracks per month into the prisons than when we were just sending them to the inmates. And we get, I mean, we, we get probably 10 new inmates contacting us every month. It's just really um, amazing. Um, we do have on our social media, we have um, daily track challenges. So, you know, if you're looking for a way to stay even more you know, engage, not just like, did I put a track in the gas pump, you know, on my way home, you know, but did I, you know, you might get a track challenge of give a track to someone wearing a green shirt or white shirt or orange shirt, or give a track to someone with a baseball hat or a cell phone or all kinds of stuff. And, you know, we, these things are coming out every day. Um, the everyday club is on Facebook and on uh, MeWe, although we're not updating it as frequently on MeWe yet, because not just not as many people there. Um, but so that's ways you can stay engaged. And if you go to this uh, bazoogan.org slash every day, it has the links to the to the Facebook group that you can join. And, you know, kind of what's nice about that is there's probably 200 people in that group that are just sort of ongoing encouragement. Hey, I shared the gospel at the gas station today. I shared the gospel here today you know, and just the, the ongoing encouragement about that. So we've got about 25 minutes till, till we're done. I want to take a little bit of time and talk about how do you go from, you know, leaving a track on the counter to um, handing a track to someone and saying, did you get one of these? You know, it's got the gospel in the back, check it out, to actually engaging them while also still keeping in mind you know, that we're trying to deal with this issue of fear. So there's a, there's a guy named Bill Fay has a, a book called Share Jesus Without Fear. And he uses a method where he highlights a verse in a Bible, hands it to someone said, read this verse. What does it mean to you? And they will repeat back, you know, this is what it means. And if they get it, if they don't say the right thing, 
then he'll say, read it again. And then they answer it and then he said, read it again. <laughs> it's like, um, so there was, there was someone that he and I were discussing evangelism and that was what, you know, they thought was a good way to do it. And so I did a little more research on that. And it turned out, you know, in his material, he's like, you know, if you don't like the verses we use, then, you know, pick your own verses. And so we, we came up with a way that we found to be very effective. Um, and I'll get to that in just a minute, but it, 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 it's based on, you know, if you're familiar with Living Waters and Ray Comfort, it's based on law to the proud and grace to the humble. So it, it comes from this passage in Matthew chapter 10 where Jesus and the rich young man, and the man says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. So you'll see here, he's using the 10 commandments in his, in his response. Teacher declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus looked around at, and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. So you'll, you'll notice here that the, the Jesus uses the law to expose the man's sin. Now, we're not going to get into the fact that, that Jesus doesn't, you know, contradict him when he, when he says he's kept all these commandments. Um, but the reason we do this is in, in Psalm 19, verse 7, it says, the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul, right? I mean, we talked about, like, like Craig's mentioned, you know, about being in Las Vegas and one guy can be handing out pornography and the other guy handing out the gospel and the person's upset with the handing out of the gospel. Why? Because it's convicting to the heart, right? So, I mean, God is working on them, you know, to convict their heart of sin. And if they're convicted of sin, they have to give an answer to that. But ultimately what we see is that this man was a tr transgressor of the first commandment. His, his money was his God. So Jesus saying, you know, the solution to your problem is, turn from your God and turn to me, right? And so then you can look at it and just to make sure that we're not taking the Bible out of the context, we can see there's plenty of other examples where Jesus takes the same approach. So you can look up these other verses, you know, in John chapter four with the woman at the well or Mark, Mark seven, Luke 10, you know, and then various uh, verses in Matthew. So we do see this throughout the gospels. But simply put, what we're saying is we give the law to the proud, right? Someone says, I've never done anything wrong. I've never even told a white lie, right? You're going to have to probably crack that nut open a little bit to get them to understand their need for the gospel, right? I mean, I think as Craig said, right, if they don't know that they need a savior, they're not going to turn to Jesus. But when they know they need a savior, like, look, you're dying of thirst. Here's some water, right? So law to the proud. but the guy that says, you walk up to him and you say, you know, are you going to go to heaven or hell? I'm, I'm going to hell. I've done all these things wrong. What can I do? Okay. I don't have to beat him over the head with the 10 commandments at that point. You know, we, we see that. And, and normally what I'll do in a, in a, in a situation like that is I'll say, yeah, I mean, we've all broken the law. We've lied, stolen, hated other people, stuff like that, you know, and they'll, you know, they're kind of nodding their head. They recognize that's what they're, what they've done. So, James 4, 6 says it this way, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, right? So how do we get to this conversation? Say hello. Ask people how they're doing. Comment on the weather. You know, we already talked about, you know, masks or no masks, vaccine, no vaccine. You know, I mean, anything that's in the news is an icebreaker, right? I mean, what's in the news now? You know, COVID relief, minimum wage, you know, should we bomb Syria or not? All these different things, right? I mean, just just turn on the news, see what see what's being talked about, and bring it into a conversation. You know, if especially if a uh, if a celebrity has died recently, you know, you can bring that up. I I can't remember the the last one that died, but you know, you can say, hey, you, did, you know, I heard so and so died. You know, do you think they went to heaven or hell? You know, well, what about you? Where would you go? Right. So 
So you can easily get into to conversations, you know, with people just by asking these type of questions. And then ultimately what we want to do is transition the conversation. You know, when Craig and I started doing this that day in the mall, um, what Brad taught us was we had these 10 commandment coins from Living Waters and just had the 10 commandments on one side. And he's like, just walk around the mall and hand out these coins. It's a great idea, except as Craig mentioned, we got thrown out of some malls later by just walking around the mall, handing out stuff like that. So we, we learned to be a little more covert when we went to the mall. Um, you know, you can hand someone a gospel track. Hey, did you get one of these? What is it? It's a gospel track. Have you ever heard the gospel before? Right. So, you know, there's no easier way to, to bring up the gospel than hand up a, hand them a gospel track. You know, you can ask, do you know any good churches? You know, here's when so-and-so died. Um, ask for directions to heaven. Do you have life assurance? Now you'll, you'll notice this one's a play on words. We have a gospel track with this on here too, of, you know, if you're asking someone has life insurance that benefits your, your loved ones you leave behind life assurance is a benefit to the, to the deceased, right? Get their opinion. What do you think happens when you die? Right. The, the goal ultimately is to find out, um, you know, what they believe. And then if they've considered what the Bible says, and I, at this point, I'll usually take it one or one or the other direction. One, one direction is um, to point them to the Bible using the, um, uh, you know, the gospel of John or the Bible bookmark that we have or both. And the other is a booklet that we wrote called the truth may impact your opinion. So it kind of depends on on who we're talking to and, you know, if they're all over the place on, on um, truth and fact and things like that, then we'll, then we'll go more towards that uh, booklet. But what we found to be very effective is using, using this bookmark. So you probably recognize it as this, this is our kind of our original uh, design. If you've been in the track club, you know, more than, more than a month or two, you've seen that. Um, we also have this patriotic version that we typically will send um, in the summer, um, we actually sent these in the in the last mailing. So if you if you've received your March mailing, um, it should be in there. And then there's other bookmarks, you know, that that look slightly different. Like uh, at Christmas time, we had one that had a candy cane on the front. the The back part of the bookmark has ten uh, questions at the top, and those questions, those ten questions, are the same. And then at the bottom, there's a, a gospel message, which is slightly uh, different, depending on which version of the track it is. Um, but the idea is to, to ask them, kind of get to this point of, you know, you have your belief, you know, I mean, one of the most outlandish I heard was a guy thought he was going to spend eternity on a giant cruise ship traveling through time and space with only people that he wanted to be on his cruise ship. And if he didn't like them, you know, then kick them overboard. And I'm just thinking like, I just thinking this is like the ultimate narcissistic, you know, afterlife, because it seems like eventually you'd kick everybody overboard and you'd be cruising through time and space by yourself on this, on this cruise ship. Right. And so then what I'll do is I'll ask him, well, have you ever thought about what the, what the Bible teaches? Right. And so, so we have this bookmark. You'll see the two websites there. The bazooka.org bookmark is kind of how to get the bookmark. And the, the second one is like an online, you know, more detailed explanation. We also have some YouTube videos that, that explain this. But the bookmark itself uses 10 verses from the New Testament. And so you can hand it out with an outreach Bible. Um, I can't remember current pricing. I think an outreach New Testament maybe is a dollar a piece or something if you buy them by the case and an outreach you know complete esv outreach bible might be like three four bucks i think last time i looked again if you buy them by the case if you go to a i don't know if there are christian bookstores anymore if they've all gone out of business but christian book dis distributors and stuff have these available so you know these three kids here ran into in the west end in dallas there's a train station that intersects with the with the um with the bus and if you ever come to dallas let us know try and meet you down there's probably our favorite you know fishing hole 
Um, but I'm talking to these three kids. I said, hey, have you ever thought about what the Bible says? And the, the guy on the right that's between me and the other two, he's like, I've been asking my mom to get me a Bible, but you know, she hadn't got me one. And I was like, oh, you want a Bible? And he's like, sure. So I reached in my backpack. They all three went home with Bibles. Right. And so, so what we do then is, you know, we ask them, you know, have you ever thought about what the Bible says? And it's very encouraging to hear people reading God's word in their own, you know, in their own. So we'll show them, you know, if you get one of these outreach Bibles, it has an alphabetical listing of the book. So we kind of quickly explain the Bible is actually a library. There's 66 books broken up by Old Testament and New Testament. And you can then um, show them, you know, how to find it. If you show them in the alphabetical um, table of contents. So I'll, sh I'll show them, you know, see the book of Hebrews. It's on page, you know, whatever it is in that Bible. Take them to there. Now you see this big number. That's a chapter number. So you see the one, then there's two, then there's three down to nine and they go, oh, that's great. And so, um, you know, they understand now how to find a verse in the Bible. And then we show them the chapter. Then we say, see these little numbers? These are verses. Okay, you see verse number 27 and they'll look down at it in their Bible and they say, can you read that? And he says, oh, it's appointed once, for, once to die and then comes judgment. You're like, great. And then you ask him the question, you know, what happens when you die? And I mean, I'll never forget this. When I, when I first made this, we had, I had this printed on a piece of paper and Craig and I were in the West End and he's like, well, try it on that guy over there. And said, okay. So I'd never done it before either. Like walk up to the guy, he reads the verse. I said, well, what happens when you die? And he goes, I don't know. I guess there's some kind of judgment or something. I'm like, yep. Okay. So you know, and, that, and the thing is, we kind of make it a little bit lighthearted, you know, it's like, these are not tough questions. Now, the nice thing is nowadays, you know, people have their device, they can just pull it up on their, on their phone or whatever, um, or, you know, bring a, bring a New Testament. And, you know, I think in that particular case, when we, as we talked to the guy, we got to about question number seven and his train came and we just shoved the bookmark in the Bible and handed it to him. And he went off or like, just look up the rest of the verses and and keep going. But what happens is, as people ask, like, what verses should I memorize? If I'm going to go out and share the gospel. What verses should I memorize? Well, here's a list of 10 you could start with. You know, I mean, I've open air preached on these verses. I've used them almost exactly as they are in, um, you know, witnessing conversations, um, you know, whether, whether I have the bookmark or not. So, I mean, it, it just turns out that this list, you know, the first five really walk you through, you know, what happens when you die? Who has sinned, right? So you ask them, who has sinned? Read this verse. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, who has sinned? Everybody, right? So like I said, they're not difficult questions. You know, what is sin, right? Because I mean, outside the church and outside, you know, when you get out of this call and you get out of your church and you, you walk into Walmart and you ask someone, you know, what's a sin? They're like, I don't know, but we're all sinners, all right? They know that we're all sinners, but, you know, so I find this very helpful. First John 3, 4 says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness, right? So now what law are we talking about, right? Are we talking about the speed limit? We're talking about shoplifting? No, we're talking about, you know, going back to Mark 10, 19, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, Right. And then you ask the guy, you know, have you ever done any of these things? And you can ask him pointed questions. Now, if you've ever watched the training there you know, that that Ray and Kirk do, you know, where where Ray is leading Kirk across the scary waters of evangelism, you know, and they point out, you know, you're not pointing your finger, you know, and you're actually, you know, admitting, like I have done all of these things, you know, in in uh, you know, thought, word, or deed you know, and you take them through a few of the commandments. I mean, you're really just trying to get them to admit that they've broken, you know, a couple of commandments, right? And, you know, there's other verses you can pull in, you know, in, in James, it says, you know, if you're guilty of breaking even the least of these commandments, you're guilty of breaking all of them. So, you know, someone who's ever lied has broken, you know, is guilty of everything. 
<clears throat> so eventually then we get to where will you spend eternity? And they read this verse, right? And it talks about not only the things that we covered like before, like murderers, but now it's talking about the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, you know? So if you can at least get them to talk about, you know, hatred being murder and, and, and that they've lied, then they'll immediately connect with this. And then where should they spend eternity, right? So <clears throat> do you think you'll be innocent or guilty? You know, and, you, and you can circle back to a courtroom example um, but this is largely based on, you know, the, the teachings that we learned, you know, from Living Waters, from Ray Comfort, you know, the, the courtroom example, if you're not familiar, is, you know, you've been arrested, we have video evidence, you've confessed your crime, is the judge going to let you go? And, you know, people will dance around on this too and say, oh, I don't know what the judge is going to do, you know, <laughs> like, you're like the judge is going to send you to jail right now what we wrote on the on the um million dollar bill track is you know what if the judge then gives you the million dollar you know bail money right so and that's really the then the picture of the gospel is that that the they have to first understand that they're they're guilty and that they deserve this eternal punishment but then once they once they recognize that, you go, wait a second, there's good news. God himself has paid your your fine. And now with the last five questions, we take them through that. You know, does God want you to go to hell? You know, and and second Peter 3 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that you should perish, right? But that each should reach repentance, right? I mean you know, I mean, God says the wages of sin is death. So why don't we drop dead as soon as we, as we, as we, as soon as we sin, right? I mean, you know, Annas and Sapphira, you know, boom, take them out and bury them, you know, but, you know, God gives us time uh, to repent. So what has God done for you? We take them to first Corinthians, you know, 15, where, you know, just a absolutely beautiful passage that, delivered to you as first importance that I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried, raised, and on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures, he appeared, appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. So, you know, the, we, we now can talk about the cross that Jesus suffered and died. We share the good news. You know, we want to include these things about, you know, 2,000 years ago, Jesus lived he was fully man, fully God, lived a perfect life, fulfilled the law, willingly became the sacrifice for sin, and then was crucified, died, and resurrected. Then we get into how much does God love you? We talk about John 3, 16, that he loved you so much he sent his son. And finally, you know, wraps up with, you know, what if you die without, without Jesus, you know, and, and um, you know, if, if we if we have the son, we have eternal life. If we don't have the son, God's wrath remains upon us. And with those three kids that I showed you at the beginning, you know, I was like, well, what are you going to do? And they're like, what else can we do but, but repent and trust in Christ? So, you know, we found this to be effective. And whether you use it, you know, all 10 questions through there. But the thing is, it gives you a nice guide. You don't have to memorize anything. But over time, as you use it more and more, uh, you will memorize it, you know, just as a, as a sake of, of um, uh, going through it. Um, so again, the bookmark, um, they, we send two in each um, mailing, um, you know, partly just because four stacks of seven plus the two bookmarks. But, you know, we kind of find that in general, people will distribute, you know, a track card you know, and then kind of use these more for conversation. So as we wrap up, I think we got about five minutes, you know, some do's and don'ts, you know, smile, greet people, be friendly. You know, we talked about the, the mask issue. You can actually tell if someone's smiling, whether, whether they have a mask on or not. <laughs> um, ask the question, did you get one of these? And I know Craig, you know, really covered this because if you ask if they want it, nobody wants anything that you're handing out. But, you know, if you said, did you get one? And it's kind of funny because we can get a new one printed 
no, never handed it out before. Take it out. Say, did you get one of these? They'll say yes. Or like, wait, I never handed this out before. <laughs> um, you know, fit the environment. You know, that kind of as much as possible. You know, uh, Craig mentioned Marilyn Manson concert. You know, it's kind of hard for some forty-year-old men to blend in, but you know, we tried. <laughs> That's we'll have to do another session on that one. Um, you know, make eye contact. You want to look them in the eye. Um, and connect with them. Um, pray for those that you're that you're witnessing with. You know, Craig and I have gone out lots of times to malls and concerts, parades, all kinds of stuff. You know, but you don't want to be you know both bombarding the person. Here, let me ask you. Let me ask you. Right, when one person's speaking, you can pray for them, and then you know always speaking the truth and love. What what we found is effective is you can hand the conversation back and forth. You know. I could be talking, hey, Craig, did you have anything to add? You know, and you kind of hand the, the conversation back and forth. And the final do is warn people to repent. You know, this is something going back to our first, um, you know, conversation, the first time out sharing the gospel with people, you know, someone gets argumentative like that of, you know, well, no, that verse says this, this says that, um, you know, they're not going to obey Christ or whatever. And you you know, if you read Luke 13, he repeats this twice to the people he's speaking to. He says, you know, repent or perish. Um, you can wear some shirts. I mean, these are things that we made. I don't think we even have this Zazzle site anymore. So another slide that should be updated. But a lot of these kind of correspond to, to tracks that we have. Um, and then some don'ts. I typically would not wear a cross, you know, when I'm trying to go out witnessing, you know, someone starts talking to you like that and you have a cross on, they're just going to naturally think you're going to the, to some kind of Christian conversation. Um, don't wear sunglasses. I mean, if your eyes are hurt and you have some medical condition, whatever, you know, that's different, but you, like I said, you want to be able to connect with them, um, heart to heart, eye to eye. Um, don't use an accusatory tone, right? I mean, when we're talking to people, you know, we'll be reminding them, hey, I've done all these things as well. And then we say, don't force a decision, right? I mean, the salvation is from the Lord. And, um, you know, we can ask, you know, maybe, maybe God's worked repentance in your heart while we've been talking and, uh, you know, kind of go from there. So some things for further study, you know, we do have this booklet, you can read it online. It's a PDF and we have audio um, the booklet was actually written for handing to people to share the gospel with, um, but it also covers a lot of these examples and, and ways that you can witness to people. Um, Mark Cahill, um, he's got a lot of resources, but these are two that you know really helped me in getting started in evangelism. As we mentioned, the School of Biblical Evangelism is really, you know, Craig and I were studying this and the, the ministry really launched out of that. And if you're looking for just a good, you know, resource for um, everyday Bible study, the Evidence Bible, and you can actually read this online if you just Google Evidence Bible, um, but it's really a neat book to have on hand because the, the footnotes are all tying back to um, evangelism. This is a bunch of stuff that's on our website. I'm not going to go through every every line. As we wrap up, you know, join the track club, make witnessing a part of your everyday life. And if you're not already reading your Bible daily, really encourage that. It's because if you're not connected to God, then it's very difficult to, um, you know, tell other people. But but don't make excuses. Just get started and 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 take the next step of whatever that is, whether it's handing out a track, you know, hand out all the tracks in your track club mailing, you know, and if you want to do any of these other things, we're, we've done everything on this list. So we're glad to talk more about that. Um, but I just want to jump to here. I know we're at that time, you know, Acts 4.13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and recognized that they had been with Jesus. So I'm an IT guy by trade computer scientist, Craig's an engineer, runs a recycling company. <coughs> we have not been to seminary. You know, we, we study God's word. We have a heart for the lost and love for God. And, 
and that's really what you know what fuels us and so you know as it says here you know when it comes when it comes to these types of you know scholarly things you know don't look at us like you would look at like we're just guys i mean we're just ordinary guys we love we love jesus and we just want to tell other people about him so if you want to reach any of us here's our uh, email addresses and um you know i know we're at time i'm willing to take a few questions if you're if you have a question or two but really appreciate everybody uh, joining us and sticking with us for two hours um i'll send out a follow-up email you know as i mentioned earlier I'll get this posted onto um, onto YouTube. So if you want to go back and watch anything again, and um, if you have questions, you can you can email any of us at these addresses. You know, if you prefer to talk to Mandy, um, you're welcome to uh, to reach her. Um, if you want to talk to Craig or I, shoot us an email. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks, everybody. Let me uh, close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you, God, for this day. We thank you for all these people joining, taking two hours out of their evening uh, to uh, listen to Craig and I about um, our experiences sharing the gospel. Lord, we pray that um, the people will be more encouraged, that they would be uh, feeling equipped and ready to go um, face the fear of man and um, leave tracks out, engage people in conversation, take that next step. We just pray that uh, there would be a sense of boldness. You tell us in your word, Lord, that a few common, ordinary men took the gospel out and they turned the world upside down. And Lord, we have many more people and um, we, have the, we have the same power of the Holy Spirit. So we pray, Lord, that um, you know, through our ministry, through um, the churches across the country, that uh, you, would, you would rise up. Uh, people and we would again uh, turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ and the gospel. And pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye. Good night. All right. Oh, on YouTube. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'll send the link, but you can find our, let me, Aaron, I can give you the YouTube. Yeah, I don't think I have your YouTube channel. So, I, yeah, I wanted to want to give that video to trevor he had to leave part way through to pick up his brother so this is your channel i don't know if i've ever, don't know if I've ever tried to sh oops <laughs> it seems like it should Did you want to like ask something someone's question and answers you sure that? yes because uh, what I was going to say was by leaving the, um, the when I leave the tip, I leave the, um, give them one of those thank you cards. CMA cards. Yes. The, no, yeah, the <laughs> CMA thing. And uh, that's, that's yeah, really man. good. Yeah, the thank you card. I mean, that's, um, that's one that's just been very, you know, popular track, powerful, you know, and, and I mean, I think, you know, and I recorded a video about this the other day. I mean, I just uploaded this, this video about the thank you track. Um, and I, I think the link was in the, the blast email that I sent out, but I'll put it in the chat here. You know, of just, I mean, the, the track actually, the idea actually came from one of our track club members in Canada that she sent us a, a letter and said, you know, why don't you just make a track that just says thank you on it. And, and I mean, it was such a good idea and, you know, just there's so many times, you know, you'd be at Walmart or something and someone has you, you ask someone directly and then you just, they're like, yeah. Hey, where's the, where's the cat litter? Well, that's on aisle 17. 
oh thank you very much you just hand them the card they're i mean it catches them by like why are you thanking me why are you handing me something you know and it i mean i i do a lot of witnessing on uh on at walmart do you <laughs> sure do i catch little kids and it's such a it's such, it's just lovely to hear little kids when you ask them, you say, well, do you know Jesus? And they're no. all, they come up with, yes, he right here in my heart. And I mean, <laughs> it, it, it goes, <laughs> I'll be like, hey, thank you, Lord. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you know, but it's sad that the parents don't know him, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the thank you track, especially like we said, with the tip, you know, is um, and I was talking to another guy the other night and, you know, we both had had an experience where we the tip was like almost as much as the bill. We like I'd gone to Sonic and paid. I think the, I think the bill was five ninety four, gave her seven dollars plus a million dollar, you know, bills and it's like a <laughs> almost a 20, you know, 20 percent tip to buy a couple of drinks. He had told me he'd been, he had gone into a diner and bought a two dollar drink, gave a dollar tip. So he was like a thirty percent tip, you know. But I'm like, you know, if I'm giving you a thirty percent tip and a little card, then they probably get the idea that it's important, and they and then yes, take a take a minute to yes to look at it. So you know, so that's why we do so, that. Um, I'm gonna turn uh, off the. Recording. Well, when are you guys gonna try to do this again? I'll put out a message. I need to talk to Craig and see, you know, what his schedule looks like. Um, if we did it again, would you just want to see the same material? You want to see something, is there something different you'd like? What do you think? Some approaches, something. some approaches, how you yeah. do, uh, like when you go to uh, the mall or something like that, so, you know, some, some of those. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think we have a lot of stories to tell. We've been doing this for like coming up on 15 years now. I don't know how to turn the recording off. You're recording. Yeah, I wonder. Um, I wonder.